Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath morning. Thank you that you give us the ability to come here to worship you. Thank you that you give us that ability when the world seems so upside down at times. When there's violence all around us, when there's times that we just don't seem to know what to do, that you are always there for us, that you are our peace and our comfort, that you are that rock that we can always count on and can always stand on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for always being that steadying comfort in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Do you know what the 10 most used words in the English language are? There have been studies on this, such as the one conducted against the Oxford English Corpus that charts almost 2 billion words. In the few seconds I've been talking, I've already used six of them. Here are the top ten words in the English language. The, be, to, of, and, a, in, that, have, I. If you were to expand that list out to the 25 most used words, adding in words like it, for, on, with, it would make up about one half of all the printed material in the English language. Expand that out to the 100 most used words in the English language, and it would make up half the printed English language. There are certain words that we use a lot. But there are other words that we work hard to stay away from. Now, we may think them. We may feel them. But we certainly don't want to say them. Because if we said them, they would just sound really bad coming out of our mouth. As you, as you know, we've been in this series on getting off of our butts. And if you've been here, you know I'm not talking about the ones that you're currently sitting on. We're talking about the butts that keep us from investing in the one thing that Jesus said was the, was the most important thing that would make our lives great. And here's a reminder of what he said. Jesus said that whoever, whoever, wants to, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. He also said whoever wants to be great must become a servant. And then in Mark 10, 45, he said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what is it? What is it that is the key to life that we are called to live? It's serving. And if we're going to make that investment, then we have to stop making excuses. We started this series off by looking at a life, the life of a remarkable man named Barnabas. And we looked at those two excuses, those two buts that he had to get off of in order to have a remarkable life. The, but I don't have enough money, and the, but I don't have the time. And then last week, we looked at that unique shape that God has given each and every one of us. A shape made up of our God-given spiritual gifts, our heart, our abilities, our personality, and our experiences. And how that helps us get off of another excuse related to the life that Jesus has called us to live. But I don't know what to do. And we learned that we are to do what you are. 
We're to invest our lives according to our shape because that's why God gave it to us. So today, I want to talk about the one excuse that we never say, at least we generally never say it out loud. The one that we never vocalize because it just sounds too bad to say it out loud. Yes, you, it may very well be the most common, maybe the most important excuse that we have to get past in order to get into that game of greatness. Are you ready for it? Here it is. But I'm all about me. Doesn't it just sound awful to say? That's why we never say it. That's why we don't want to say it. It it sounds terrible. It's too self-centered, too selfish, too prideful. But but we think it. We feel it. And often, far too often, we live by it. At least, maybe not you, but, but I know I think it. I feel it. And too often, I live by it. And if I'm brutally honest, perhaps it's my default mode and and that's why it shouldn't surprise me shouldn't surprise me it shouldn't surprise you that this is the the one excuse the one but that jesus went after the most the one that he had to go after the most in order to get people to experience the life that he called us to live the greatness that only comes by serving the difference that's made, the legacy that's created, the life change that happens when we embrace the life that Jesus, who didn't come to be served, but came to serve and to give his life away when we live that life that he called us to live. So how did Jesus attack this excuse? How did he get people to realize that they were sitting on that excuse, but I'm all about me, and that they needed to get past that excuse? Well, he did it in the most powerful way imaginable. He lived a life in front of people that was the antithesis of that excuse. He lived in a way that wasn't about himself at all. It was all about selfless, sacrificial, serving of others in a spirit of humility. And I want to take a look at a scene from his life that that I've talked about before, and you've probably have read about it before. And here is the scene. Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I want to pause there. Why did he wash their feet? What's, what's the backstory here? See, the backstory, the history here, is that they didn't have paved roads like we have. The roads were mostly dirt, and people didn't wear shoes like we have. They often went barefoot or occasionally wore what we would call sandals the major form of transportation wasn't cars they would walk or or would use donkeys or camels and the roads were used for moving livestock such as sheep or or cattle so you have dirt manure urine who knows what else wherever you were walking and if it rained you can imagine a nasty filthy mess so whenever you would go to an inn or to a friend's house for a meal or for a party there would be someone stationed at the door usually a paid servant or in that day it could be an indentured slave who had a basin of water in a towel and they would wash and then dry your feet and because people's feet would be so nasty, it, would, it was considered one of the lowliest of jobs you could possibly have. And if by chance there wasn't someone that was available to do that job, it would fall to 
a volunteer or even to the host. Maybe the first person to arrive or the host themselves would have to do it if there was no, no paid guest or a, a slave. So here was Jesus and his disciples gathered for what was known as the Passover feast and what would later become forever known as the Last Supper. And there was no one at the door to wash the feet. And not a single one of the disciples who had all arrived before Jesus volunteered to do it. None of them wanted to assume that they were the servant of the others. No one wanted to stoop down to washing another person's feet. Think of how many butts they were sitting on that day but it's not my job, but it's not my responsibility, but it's beneath me. But, but why should I be the one to do it? But it's not my gift, but, th but that's not my thing. But I'm too important for that. But I washed feet the last time we got together. But all of those go into the one main thing. But I'm all about me. But then Jesus walks into the room and they're all sitting at the table reclining. They're all there lying around that table with proud hearts and dirty feet. And Jesus walks in and takes one look and you can just imagine what he must have been thinking. He poured three years into these men, talking to them over and over again about serving, about how important it was to serve others. This was the night before he was about to do the ultimate act of service. He was about to give his life up in service. He's going to stretch his arms out in service. And all he sees are these men unwilling to do one task of servanthood. And just to point out one other just minor detail, None of them offered to wash Jesus' feet either. So when it was time to eat, let me read that, what happened again this time in the message paraphrase. Jesus got up from the supper table, set aside his robe, put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. After he had finished washing their feet, he took his robe, put it back on, and went back to his place at the table. Then he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You address me as teacher and master, and rightly so. That is what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, washed your feet, you must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. The conviction of that moment had to have been palpable. The realization of how bad their attitudes and their, how bad their spirit have been must have hit pretty deep. And then to have had it revealed by Jesus, by him doing what they had been unwilling to do, to take on that lowest role, the one they felt was beneath them, and to do it to each and every one of them. And then to say, this is how you should do life. 
This is how you need to follow me. You need to wash feet. They were all sitting there on their butt, on the, but I'm all about me. And Jesus reminded them, it's not, but I'm all about me. It's not all about you. It's about selflessly, humbly serving others. You're not called to selfishness. You're called to selflessness. You're not called to have your feet washed. You're called to wash the feet of others. When you're living like me, you're walking through life with a towel over your arm. You're not thinking about being served. You're looking for ways how you can serve others. You're not thinking about what people can do for you you're, or what they should do for you. You're looking for ways that you can add value to the life of others. It apparently got through to some of them, particularly when coupled with what happened that next day, with Jesus going to the cross and, and paying the ultimate sacrifice as a suffering servant. Because when you look through the writings of the New Testament written by some of those men sitting around that same table, it's interesting to see how they often began some of those letters. Because when you would write a letter back then, you would begin with a short introduction. And when you notice how some of those letters were written, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, Simon Peter, a servant. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. They all start by identifying themselves as a servant. If only they had learned it a little sooner and it wasn't after Jesus' death. They seemed to finally get it. And as a result, many of them led lives of true greatness. So why is it, though, why is it that we sit on this excuse still to this day? Why can't we learn what they learned? This anti-serving excuse that, that we still live with today, the one that refuses to wash feet, the one that it's, continues to say, but it's all about me, that I'm all about me. And this, this hurts. At least it should hurt. Because if we live with that excuse, if we still live with that excuse, this is the reason behind it. It's because we don't believe Jesus. If we are that selfish, the true reason is we don't believe Jesus. We don't believe that serving is best because that's what he tells us. He tells us that serving is what makes our lives great. But if we don't, then we don't believe him. And since we're all about ourselves, we're going to do what we think will make us happy, what will serve us, what will make life easiest for us. See, the word serve is related to the word give. And give means taking what I have and giving it away. To never have it again. Letting someone else benefit from it instead of it benefiting me. It means I have less. Someone else has more. I no longer have that time. I no longer have that money for my benefit. How I want to be perceived is diminished. I'm the one who is to be served, I'm not the one who is to serve. It's that selfishness that we have to get rid of. It's almost like we want to be like narcissists. 
that in Greek mythology, Narcissus is the character who on seeing his reflection in the water becomes so enamored with himself that he devotes the rest of his life to gazing at his own reflection. That's where we get our term narcissist, being preoccupied with ourselves. Jesus was right. The key to the life that we actually say we long for is not achieved by making it all about ourselves, but making it all about others. When Jesus said, if you want to be great, become a servant, he was calling us to see things from an entirely different point of view. He knew that the life we most long for, the one that we were created to live, Everything of lasting value that can be gained is found through a life of selflessness, of sacrifice, and through serving. So let me tell you four things that serving will do for your life that you won't be able to experience in any other way. Number one, serving is what gets you and keeps you in top spiritual shape one of the most important spiritual workouts you can ever experience. And I don't think you'd be here, whether you're here in person or watching online, I don't think you'd be here. I don't think you'd have, I don't, if you didn't have some interest in spiritual formation, some interest in developing your spiritual life. So how do you develop yourself spiritually? Is it just by listening to a sermon? No. No. That's not enough. You do it by taking what is taught from the Bible and about spiritual formation from these times and then you put it into play. One of the most important ways is by serving others. See, when you give yourself away for the sake of others, that's what builds up your faith. Think about how exercise works on the body. When you uh, lift weights, you increase the level of contractile proteins and connective tissues in the muscles you exercise, making those muscles bigger and stronger than they were before. Your spiritual life works the same way. When it, when it comes to serving and caring for others, it's because it's through serving that you give your faith the necessary workout. It needs to grow larger and stronger. It's when you practice and work out the muscles of selflessness. You practice and work out the muscles of humility. The practice and work out the muscles of sacrifice. And I'll tell you one thing I can say with almost complete certainty. If you're not giving of yourself, if you're not serving others in some selfless, sacrificial, servant-hearted way, If that's not part of your life, then I can almost guarantee you that your spiritual life is shallow, weak, and undeveloped. I can almost also guarantee you that unless something changes, it's going to stay exactly that way. A second reason that serving matters is because making a difference matters. You can't make a difference in this world, much less in other people's lives, without serving people at their point of need, giving to people at their point of need. Serving others is what gets you into the only game that matters. It's the way you get involved in what God is doing in this world. Serving, because, serving matters because making a difference matters. And every act of service, no matter how big, no matter how small, makes a difference. And isn't that what you want? To make a difference with your one and only life. There's only one way to make that happen. Make the investment in selfless service. You see, once you see a changed life, 
hear even one thank you, see one brief glimpse of an impact from some act of service you've done, you'll see how much it matters. A third reason for having a towel over your arm matters is because it's the only way that you can find and fulfill your individual life and purpose. I've heard so many people say, if, if I only knew God's will for my life, if I only knew what my life purpose was, you do. That's just an excuse. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created, created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God has got all of this amazing stuff that he wants you to do. He's planned it all out, and it's all about service. It's all about doing something with our lives. You were created to take who God made you to be and to put yourself into play as a selfless, sacrificial, servant-hearted athlete in this world. The more you put yourself into play, the more involved you become with what God is doing in this world and what he wants to do through you. The final thing that you can do, the degree to which you serve others often determines the degree to which others will serve you. See, when you wash other people's feet, it doesn't just result in more clean feet in the world. It also means that there will be a greater chance that when you need your feet washed, there will be someone ready to do it. The more you give, the more you'll receive you will never be able to outgive God. Never. So how do you get going on all of this? It's rather simple. Start serving. Take hold of a need and serve. Don't worry about the where as much as having a spirit that says, anywhere. Last week we talked about getting in touch of our shape and then doing what we are and that's an important path to pursue when it comes to serving. But the ultimate shape we are to get in touch with is the shape of a servant kneeling on one knee with a towel and a basin of water because there are feet in need of washing. I want to give you three ways that you can serve starting today. Three ways, three easy ways to serve that anyone can do. The first one, you can give. Generosity is one of the most unselfish, sacrificial acts that there is. When you give here at TAF, you are giving to the work that God is doing in this community. There are many ways that you can give here at TAF. You can give online at a website, triadadventistfellowship.com. In the back of the room, there are two chairs with baskets on it. If you're an old school person who prefers cash or check, you can give back there. They're back there every week. Some people don't even know they're back there. We don't pass baskets anymore. That's what they're back there for. If you, you can give in person, you can give online. When you give here at TAF, you're giving food to the homeless. You're giving food to those in need. You're, give, you're helping out through community service. But you know what you, when you give, what you give to is the most important thing you give to? When you give at TAF, you're giving to the greatest revolution on this planet, which is God calling people back to himself. When you give, you are telling others about Jesus and how he can intersect their deepest needs of their life. You are saving people's lives. Because this church is reaching people in person and online. You are doing that. Another way to serve is to volunteer. 
is to serve with one of our ministries that we have here. We need volunteers. You can serve in children's ministry. You can welcome people. You can serve by in breakfast or in lunch. You can sing or play an instrument. You can serve in, in any of the ministries, online ministries. You can serve our ho- homeless population. You can do all of these things and so much more. You can serve by giving of your resources. You can serve in investing in ministries and serving in opportunities. But there's one more way that you can serve. You can serve someone you care about at their greatest spiritual need by inviting them to come and see, to come and explore, to come and experience all that God has for them and their life here at TAF. In about just over a month, we will be celebrating our eighth anniversary here at TAF. Over that time, a lot of things have changed here. But over that time, one thing that has never changed is the reason why people show up. The number one reason why people say they have come to this church is because someone invited them. The number one reason is because someone invited them. It's the easiest thing you can do to serve this church, to serve those that you love, is by inviting them to church. If you were to engage this one aspect of service, it could alter the entire trajectory of someone's life, even into eternity. You need to serve. Your life, the lives of others, matter too much not to. Stop making excuses and start serving. So this week, this week, let me challenge you. If you haven't been giving before now, if you haven't volunteered for one of our ministries and serving opportunities before now, if you haven't invited a friend, a neighbor, a family member, a coworker to TAF, whether in person or online, before now, it's time to put a towel over your arm and to start washing some feet. Heavenly Father, thank you that you took that opportunity to put that towel over your arm and to wash the disciples' feet. Thank you that you weren't like me who probably would have walked in the room and just yelled at them. Thank you that you have a servant's heart. Help us to get past that mindset of it being all about me. Give us that servant heart. Help us to be selfless, to be willing to serve wherever that may be. Help us to see those in need and to be willing to serve. And especially help us to be willing to invite others to you, to get to know you, to invite them to come to this place so that they may find a relationship with you a relationship that may last into eternity and can enti- and change their entire life. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>